Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm uh, honored and thrilled to be here. So uh, the first thing to say, I guess, is, is happy birthday, Dirk. I guess it's very belated at this point, if I'm not mistaken, it's sometime in, uh, in July. Um, so Dirk uh, was a very important kind of mathematical influence uh, on me uh, about 15 years ago when I arrived in Boston, uh, where Dirk was spending half the year at the time. I uh, started talking to him and, and learning about his work on renor the Hoff algebras of renormalization and uh, thinking about how, uh, how these structures could be kind of lifted to a categorical level. And so, uh, in fact, um, today's talk, which is sort of based on recent work, is, is very much, uh, at least in my mind, uh, related to, uh, to that set of ideas. And, uh, over the years, I've, I've had the pleasure of visiting him in, uh, in Paris and in, uh, in Berlin, and I have uh, great memories of those visits. So uh, thanks for all the inspiration, Dirk. All right, so let me, uh, let me get started. So um, the main idea of this talk is that uh, one can interpret things like the Hoff algebra of rooted trees or the Hoff algebra of Feynman graphs, as well as a number of other combinatorial Hoff algebras as Hall algebras. And what's a Hall algebra? Well, a Hall algebra is an algebra whose structure coefficients uh, count uh, extensions or short exact sequences in a, in a category. And um, um, so, so I will talk about these types of categories and um, I will, the, the ultimate goal is to describe a construction which, which attaches to uh, a projective toric variety, uh, a Hoff algebra. Uh, and um, this will arise as applying the Hall algebra construction to some, some category of, of coherent sheaves in, a, in sort of a somewhat strange setting. So um, my plan is to, is to first uh, talk a little bit about Hall algebras in the kind of traditional setting. They, they are a tool that, uh, that is important in representation theory. Um, and uh, so for people who study quiver representations and, and uh, quantum groups and things like this. Um, but the, uh, the setting in which we will ultimately apply them is actually somewhat different, uh, which are sort of categories that are uh, combinatorially defined, which are non-additive, um, but, um, but nevertheless, one can do the same thing. Uh, and then I'll uh, I'll discuss some some elements of sort of the algebraic geometry of monoid schemes and uh, and uh, the kind of combinatorics we see in in that setting. Um, okay, so <clears throat> what's the uh, what's the traditional setting of uh, of Hall algebras? Um, the way it it has been sort of they have been used in in uh, representation theory since at least the eighties. Uh, you start with an abelian category, which has some strong finiteness conditions. So it's, this is called being finitary. And it means that uh, the, uh, the, set of, the set of morphisms or the set of maps between any two objects, as well as the, the set of extensions between any two objects are finite as sets. Okay, so this is, this is uh, pretty, uh, this is not so easy to, to achieve somehow because, um, you know, many, if, if, the, if the category is linear over, over some field, that field better be finite or else a finite dimensional vector space is not gonna be a finite set. So the two main sources of, of examples uh, of these types of categories uh, are uh, quiver representations. So quiver is a directed graph and a representation is, uh, well, we attach um, vector spaces and linear maps along the edges. So the category of quiver representations over a finite field has, has this property. And another uh, geometric source of examples is the, is the category of coherent sheaves when, uh, when X is a projective variety over a finite field. Okay, so these are the kind of two main examples one, one can have. So what is a Hall algebra? Well, uh, as a, as a vector space, it's just functions on isomorphism classes in the category. So uh, we just take 
this this is the most naive version of Hall algebra, I should say. There are more sophisticated versions, but just take functions on isomorphism classes that have finite support. So they're non-zero and only finitely many isomorphism classes. And you can equip these with uh, a type of convolution product. So um, if the convolution evaluated on the isomorphism class of an object M is obtained by summing over all subobjects N of M and evaluating F on the quotient and G on the on the sub subobject. So if you uh, if you squint your eyes and replace the summation sign with an integral here, and uh, think of m mod n as x minus y and you know n as y, then you can see why this is called a convolution. It's reminiscent of convolution of the functions in harmonic analysis. Um, so a basis for these finitely supported functions is given by um, by functions on uh, just individual isomorphism classes, delta functions. And so if you if you convolve two delta functions, uh, what you uh, what you see happens is uh, you uh, you get you get a summation where the structure coefficients uh, count the following or, or, or the structure coefficients correspond to the following numbers. So you're counting the subobjects of K, which are isomorphic to N, and such that uh, K mod the subobject is isomorphic to M. So up to some automorphism groups, uh, what you're counting are short exact sequences of, of this form. So N goes to K goes to M, okay? So that's what I meant when I said that the structure coefficients of Hall algebras count short exact sequences. And, and of course, this implies that these structure coefficients are non-negative also, right? Since they count things. Um, now to, I'm gonna try to uh, sort of connect this stuff with, with sort of quantum groups. And um, when, if you've seen quantum groups, you know there are a bunch of powers of Qs floating around. And to, to get those, uh, we have to take a slight twist of the multiplication. So uh, you introduce something called the multiplicative Euler form. And um, you, so, so here is a, a formula. So of course, the, for this formula to make sense, you really need a, a category where, you know, X are, are non-zero only in, in uh, infinitely many uh, degrees, so something of a finite homological dimension. Uh, and you can think of this as, as basically Q to the power of the ordinary Euler, Euler form. Um, and so, so we take our old multiplication, except we multiply through by this, what will ultimately basically be, be a power of Q that depends on M and N here, okay? Um, and then, uh, the, the theorem of, of Ringo and Green is that is that if you have a, a finitary abelian category, then uh, these um, these these algebras, either the one with the Euler form or without it, are are associative algebras. Okay, so you get a you get an associative ring. Um, now, if you want to study co-algebra structures. Um, this becomes a little bit more subtle. So, um, you if if A happens to be be hereditary, so that the that the that the global dimension of A is less than or equal to one, then you can uh, you can equip this with a with a coproduct and an antipode, um, and and get a get a Hopf algebra. In some cases, this this won't this will be something like a topological uh, Hopf algebra because the uh, the coproduct might not uh, might land in the completion, for instance. But roughly speaking, you get a get a Hopf algebra, but only in this in this nice case where the the global dimension is less than or equal to one. Um, and now, the the claim is that that if you if you see if if you, if you look at what you get in, in, as as these Hall algebras, you get sort of interesting. Um, quantum group type things. So 
Uh, as I said, the kind of two main examples of, of categories were um, that are that are finitary and abelian, um, being quivers and, and coherent sheaves on some uh, on some projective variety. So so here's the the first theorem tells us what happens when when we look at quiver representations. Um, so if I take a quiver, I can view the underlying um, graph, undirected graph, as a Dinkin diagram for for some for some Kutz-Moody algebra, and um, the, the theorem states that that this uh, um, that this Hall algebra that we computed by counting short exact sequences uh, contains uh, sort of a, a positive half of the quantum group corresponding to this to this Cuts Moody algebra. So, roughly speaking, uh, just like ordinary uh, let's say semi simple or Cuts Moody algebras, these quantum groups have kind of triangular decompositions. And roughly speaking, this plus means that we're looking at the kind of upper triangular part here. Um, and this map is um, is a, is an isomorphism in in sort of finite type. So when the when the when the Dinkin diagram is of type ADE, then then this is actually an isomorphism. And there there is then a kind of a procedure uh, by using using the Drinfeld double. Uh, which you could then use to uh, to recover the entire quantum group. So, I guess what I want to emphasize here is that if we hadn't learned about quantum groups from from Drinfeld and, and Jimbo, we could have discovered them in principle by using this uh, this Hall algebra construction. And another thing to kind of point out is that this uh, the the order of the field, which is Q, right? This Q is a prime power. The square root of this thing appears as the uh, as the deformation or the quantization parameter here okay so so somehow um, prime powers have something to do with quantization and and uh, I'm not sure if anyone really understands why that is um, okay and so so this was this is a theorem that somehow tells us what happens with quivers and uh, as a just a sampling I'll mention this theorem of Kapranov and Castle Bauman which tells you what happens if you take the category of coherent sheaves on uh, on just P1 or you know simplest projective uh, variety you could have over a finite field. And then also you see uh, a quantum group type object you have uh, but now it's a it's a quantum affine algebra. So so roughly speaking this is this is what happens if you if you were to uh, to quantize the the loop algebra of SL two rather than just SL two itself. Um, okay, so so in, in in both of these cases we get some some interesting kind of quantum group, um, and there's been lots of work on this by 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 many authors. So uh, uh, there's work of of Bourbon Schiffman, uh, Eric Vassero, uh, Kapranov, and uh, and and many uh, many other people. Um, and, and so, so as you as you increase the so in in the case of coherent sheaves, if you increase the complexity of the uh, of the variety, this thing gets complicated fast. So already um, already for elliptic curves, it's 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 not it's not easy to see what what happens, and you get interesting algebras like the uh, sort of double affine Heck algebras show up, um, and uh, Sort of more generally, this the study of, of of Hall algebras of curves over finite fields is, is sort of related to uh, to the theory of automorphic forms on on function fields. So, the the action of the Hall algebra on itself corresponds here to uh, to the action of sort of geometric Hecke operators. Um, so so already for high genus, it's sort of aside from kind of abstract results, it's not easy to see what happens concretely. And when when X is a variety of dimension greater than one, then basically um, it's you know very little is known and, and understood about uh, what 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 these what these Hall algebras look like. Uh, and and also these these categories of coherent sheaves no longer have global dimension one or less so the the sort of co-algebra structure i mean you can write down a ring 
but uh, you know whether this is a Hopf algebra or not becomes a, a much harder question. And uh, and so the SOC is ultimately aiming to to look at this last case of sort of higher dimensional varieties, but in a certain kind of combinatorial limit, a, a, a type of classical limit. Um, okay, so going back to to the formula for um, for the the multiplication in the Hall algebra. Um, if we look at this, uh, there's nothing about this formula which somehow explicitly requires the category to be abelian or, or additive. Okay, so, so uh, even though historically people were looking at quiver representations or coherent sheaves, um, there's, uh, this, this formula makes sense in sort of a more general context. And, uh, and that's the context that we'll be interested in. Um, when, uh, when I started thinking about this, uh, there wasn't really necessarily a very good framework for thinking about these non-additive examples, but since there's been very nice work of, of Dickerhoff and Kapranov, um, they define a class of categories um, called uh, proto-exact categories, okay? And these are, uh, these are somehow, th these are generalizations of, of Quillen exact categories, but which are allowed to be non-additive and which are somehow tailored to, uh, to Hall algebras. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a very nice formalism uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that was developed by them and, and sort of related to kind of higher categorical aspects of the story also. Um, and something to note is that that any any of these sort of proto-exact categories has a has an associated algebraic k-theory. Okay, so you can you can define a k-theory of uh, sort of higher k groups of of anything that is that is proto-exact. Um, and what they show is that if um, if you have a, a proto-exact category, uh, which is again finitary, so that uh, the morphisms between any pair of objects and the extensions of, of any two objects are finite as sets, uh, then you can write down uh, an associative algebra uh, using the formula that we saw before. So everything works kind of as, as expected. All right, so, um, so now there are lots of uh, examples of these proto exotic categories that are combinatorial and non-added. And, um, and so uh, let me just mention a few. Uh, well, the simplest, uh, the simplest example is, that is not additive is perhaps um, is, is the category of pointed sets. Okay, so, um, and uh, sort of related examples are, uh, if you take a monoid, then the category of, of modules over the monoid, whereby module, I mean uh, a pointed set uh, with uh, with the action of the of the monoid, so things that are by people in semigroup theory are called acts sometimes. Um, other examples are you know you can take a quiver and instead of putting vector spaces on, on each vertex, you can put pointed sets. And again, things can be made to work more or less as before. But other other uh, structures and combinatorics such as uh, pointed matroids. Um, and then the examples that come up in renormalization, things like rooted, uh, rooted trees and forests, uh, as well as Feynman graphs are examples of these, uh, these proto-exact categories. Um, which means, as I, as I mentioned already, that, that therefore they have um, uh, an associated algebraic K theory. So, which, which we know is interesting because, uh, I mean, I'll get to this in a second, but uh, um, these, these hierarchy groups are, are somehow known to be very interesting. Um, but the, the thing that will be of, of the main interest in this talk is this last example, which is the, the category of, of coherent sheaves on, um, on, on, on something called the monoid scheme. So um, I, I will, this, this uh, monoid schemes are, are basically uh, sort of versions of, of algebraic geometry in a, in a non-additive context and uh, um, sort of correspond to, 
uh, sort of combinatorial limits of, of, of ordinary of ordinary schemes, if you will. But all, they are they are a good source of these sort of non-additive categories where Hall algebras uh, still make sense. Um, so my goal uh, is is basically to do the following. So uh, since we know that uh, we know that uh, Hall algebras give interesting quantum groups. And, and uh, so, so in particular, if you have a higher dimensional variety, something like a surface and beyond, you would expect to, uh, if by looking at this, this Hall algebra of coherent sheaves over FQ, you would hope to get some sort of interesting, maybe quantum group like object, but this seems very hard. Um, so, so let's try to do something simpler and let's try to compute its classical limit. So I wanna take the limit as the deformation parameter uh, this Q goes to one and see what happens to, uh, to this Hall algebra. Okay, so it should, it should become somehow more commutative in, in this limit. Um, and, and hope to, to use this information about this classical limit to understand something about the, uh, the original structure of, of the thing that uh, we, uh, we're really after, which is, which is the kind of quantum object. Um, and this somehow ties in with this, this kind of philosophy of, of doing things over the, uh, the field of one element. And uh, uh, this, this, this stuff comes up when, you're, uh, when you look at, 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 at limits of calculations over finite fields as, uh, as Q goes to one. Um, so this is, this is an old story and, and you know, a, a kind of a set of, I would claim it's it's more of a set of sort of interesting analogies and ideas rather than than maybe a sort of a complete theory at this stage, but uh, but the ideas are kind of neat, I think. So let me give a, a couple of examples here. So for instance, uh, let's consider the enumerative combinatorial problem of counting subspaces of uh, n-dimensional vector space. Uh, over FQ, over a finite field. So in other words, I want to count the number of points of this Grassmannian over FQ. So if you do this, uh, it's an elementary exercise to see that, that this is given by a rational function, which is called the a rational function in Q, which is called the Q binomial coefficient and choose K. Um, and if you take this rational function and it has a has a, def, a well defined limit as q goes to one, in which case it's this that limit is just the ordinary binomial coefficient. So this this sort of leads to this idea that the that the limit as q goes to one of the category of vector spaces over FQ is something like the category of sets or maybe better pointed sets. Okay, because uh, you want some some uh, something corresponding to zero in your uh, in your quote unquote vector space. Um, so again, this leads to this idea that a pointed set is a vector space over F4. Um, let me just mention another sort of classical observation here. This is due to Tietz, is that if you take a, if you take a, a, a simple algebraic group um, over FQ and you, um, you count so so you count the number of points of this group over FQ, and you you take the limit suitably normalized here as Q goes to one. What you will find is that you get the order of the vial group of, of G, and so so this again sort of led to this this notion that maybe you know if 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 we if we had a good theory of algebraic groups over F1, then then the so somehow F1 points of a, of an algebraic group should be the vial group. Okay, and to some degree, this has actually been been made precise um, in you know the work of of Lorscheid and uh, and uh, Konkansani and others. Okay. Um, so the I'm not going to get into this very much, but the you know the basics of of this sort of dictionary is 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 the following. So the category of, of vector spaces uh, over F1 should be something like pointed sets. Uh, an algebra over over F1 should be a monoid. So all these all the structures over F1 are somehow non-additive. So 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 you lose addition there. So 
uh, as you go from vector spaces to sets, you, you lose addition. As you go from algebras to monoids, again, you lose addition. Uh, you know, the notion of a module is, is, uh, becomes a pointed set with an action of a, of a monoid. And so it's not surprising that the notion of kind of a, a scheme or algebraic variety over F1 should also be something built out of monoids. So uh, let, me, uh, let me say a few words about what, what monoid schemes are. Um, so so I have this, this one additional slide here. So, you know, in at least in my mind, these various sort of proto-exact or proto-abelian categories that are non-additive are somehow, uh, you know, can be in some cases at least sort of thought of as, as limits, uh, as Q goes to one of, 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 of sort of additive things. So, so these, these are somehow the, the analogs of, of abelian categories, abelian or exact categories over F1, things like matroids and, and graphs and things like this. Um, and, and, and in this combinatorial setting, uh, so I, I mentioned already that this, if you're working over FQ, the, the issue of the existence of a, of a co-algebra structure becomes kind of subtle. Um, you, you need some conditions to, to define a co-algebra structure. But if you're working with these combinatorially defined categories, you can do something very simple-minded. So our Hall algebra is functions on isomorphism classes. And most of these combinatorial gadgets have some, have a kind of a co-product uh, co in that category, which more or less uh, amounts to disjoint union or, 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 or wedge sum, which is kind of the pointed version of disjoint union, right? So if we have two Feynman graphs, we can take their disjoint union. If we have two rooted trees, we can take their disjoint union and get a, get a forest. And, and so, so on with, with combinatorial objects, the, the co-products are somehow uh, more or less disjoint unions. And so, um, so you can define a co-algebra here, a co-algebra structure, which just sends a function to the function evaluated on this, this disjoint union or, or, or wedge sum. Um, and this turns out to actually be compatible with the product for in, in these combinatorial categories. So you, you get something which is manifestly a co-commutative uh, Hall algebra or a co-commutative co uh, uh, bi-algebra, and um, it's you can it's also easy to see that there is a natural natural grading by by kind of a positive cone inside the the Gerthini group, and this thing is connected. So so you always get something which is which is a kind of graded connected co-commutative Hoff algebra, and so. At this point, we can apply the, the milner moore theorem. It'll tell us that uh, what we have is, is, is an enveloping algebra, OK? Um, so and this, uh, this, this Lie algebra, uh, this, this Hall-Lie algebra, is, is just uh, corresponds to indecomposable objects. So, so things like uh, you know, graphs that are connected or trees that are, uh, or I mean, things that are honestly rooted trees and not, not forests and so on. Um, I should say here that uh, in, in connecting uh, the, the sort of Hall algebra story with the usual uh, story of, of the, the Hoff algebra of graphs or trees, what we're getting here is the dual, right? Rather than, than uh, so, so we're getting a, a, an algebra which is non-commutative but co-commutative as opposed to how maybe most of the time the these these half algebras are viewed. Um, so so let me uh, uh, so let, let, let let's see how this uh, kind of this classical uh, classical limit idea works out. So we want to we want to use this kind of story about Hall algebras together with uh, this sort of F one philosophy to to compute some classical limits. So. Um, well, let me just give give a couple of examples. So, if you um, if you take uh, the um, if you look at the category of of 
of modules over the sort of the, the, the free monoid on one generator. So uh, this is the monoid who's, which is just powers of T. Then, uh, then, this, then the, the Hall algebra of this category that you get is, um, is, is, is basically a dual of, of Dirk's Hoff algebra of, of rooted trees. And this is because to give them uh, to equip a set with an action of this of this monoid is basically to draw a directed graph, uh, which which tells you how T acts, and then you can see that the type of graphs that can arise are are either rooted trees or sort of cycles with with rooted trees attached. Um, and if you take uh, if you take the if you take a quiver and you um, uh, and you look at uh, at the representation of that quiver and pointed sets, which somehow you should view as the kind of Q goes to one limit of of the category of ordinary quiver representations, what do we get? Uh, well, so the naive guess would be that I mean the sort of quote unquote classical limit of of what we had before, which was the positive half of the quantum group, should be just the enveloping algebra of the positive part of, of, of this uh, of this Kasmudi algebra. Uh, what you actually get is, in general, you get this modulo a certain ideal, which I'm not going to describe here. But uh, this somehow reflects kind of a, a, a non-flatness of this, this kind of Q goes to one limit. So, so something non-trivial happens as Q goes to one. And so you get something which is kind of maybe smaller than expected. Um, however, if the, if the quiver is of type A, uh, everything works nicely. So you, you get exactly the, the enveloping algebra of upper triangular matrices. So, so as we know in mathematics, everything works nicely in type A and then, then it doesn't work as nicely in other cases. Um, okay, and, and so the, these, these Hall algebras applied to other, um, to, to other kind of combinatorial categories recover sort of other types of, of uh, well, for, for Feynman graphs, we get the dual of, of Dirk's algebra of, of graphs and for, uh, for matroids, you get uh, the dual of, of Schmidt's uh, matroid minor Hoff algebra and, and so on. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, these, these categories have, um, have, uh, have an associated algebraic K-theory. And just to indicate that this K-theory is interesting, um, in the simplest case, if we take vector spaces over F1, which is pointed sets, and these K groups correspond to the stable homotopy groups of, of spheres. So, so even in the, and the, this is somehow the simplest case. So, so in, in several other cases, like for instance, these, the case of matroids, you can show that this, that this K theory here is at least as big as homotopy groups of spheres in the sense that there's, there's the, 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 the K theory of, of F1 vector spaces sits inside of these things quite often. Um, so, so these are these these K groups are 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 interesting and and somehow hard to to compute. Okay, so so let me uh, let me finally talk about these uh, these trying to do algebraic geometry in this kind of non-additive setting, um, which will ultimately lead us to to toric varieties or 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 rather to their kind of monoid versions. So, we know that that you know an ordinary uh, scheme in algebraic geometry is obtained by gluing spectra of rings. Uh, and you can do the same thing with, uh, with spectra of monoids. So if we have commutative monoids, you can define prime ideals. You can, uh, you can define as a risky topology and, and, and do the same exact same thing you do for rings. And, and what you do, what you obtain when you glue these things together is, uh, is is a is a space which is a it's a, mon a monoidal space so it's a it's a topological space with a sheaf of monoids on it um, and this is uh, this is what a monoid scheme is it's it's the exact same story based on commutative monoids rather than commutative rings um, just to uh, um, just to give you a 
sort of a, a flavor for for this. So so what are what are some of these kind of simplest schemes? The thing to kind of notice here is that these schemes have very few points. So uh, if we take the affine line, which is which normally is spec of polynomials. Uh, so instead, in the monoid version, we would look at spec of a, a monoid on one generator, and this thing has only has two points. So it has it has exactly one prime ideal, the one generated by t, and it has the, the kind of generic point corresponding to zero. Um, if we, uh, so, so the kind of monoidal version of affine n space is you take the free commutative monoid on n generators and uh, you look at prime ideals in that. And, and in fact, these correspond to subsets of these variables, exactly the kind of coordinate subspaces. Um, and, and so part of the reason why there are very few points is, is uh, so, so as, as I will maybe say, this monoid schemes are closely tied to kind of toric geometry and, and their points in this kind of monoid sense correspond to, uh, to torus equivariant uh, uh, subschemes in the, in the sort of ordinary story of toric varieties. So there are much fewer of these sort of torus equivariant things than there are of, of points in general, of course. Um, and so here I also give an example. Well, you, you can take two copies of the affine line to, uh, and glue to, uh, to, get, uh, to get P1. So P1 now uh, just has three points. It has zero infinity and a, and a generic point. Um, okay, so, so how is, how is uh, how are monoid schemes related to to kind of toric varieties? Well, um, toric varieties are determined by fans, and a fan gives you a monoid scheme. So, um, so a fan in in the kind of toric sense is a is is a is a collection of cones uh, satisfying some some properties. Let me just give an example, and the way that so, so here's a here's a fan. It's basically a way of dividing R two into into three chambers in a nice way. And the way that so these three colored regions here, these are the three cones. Um, each cone, uh, if you look at the uh, at the kind of lattice points that that live within each of these regions, you get a you get a finitely generated semigroup, and um, or a monoid, and and these. Uh, this picture kind of tells you how these monoids are, are glued together. And this data can be assembled to sort of gluing data for, uh, uh, for a scheme, for, for, uh, for, you know, for a monoid scheme, okay? It's, and if you linearize this object, meaning instead of taking uh, the monoid, you take the monoid algebra, you would, the monoid ring, you would get a toric variety in the, uh, in the kind of ordinary sense. Okay, so in, in, in uh, the three cones in that picture give us give us these three monoids. So so sigma naught is is the uh, uh, is the is the first quadrant here, and and the the, the semi group of lattice points here is generated by the standard basis vectors e one and e two, um, and so this corresponds to the variables x one x two, and these. Uh, these other cones give us uh, give us different uh, different semi groups. Okay, so let's uh, let me discuss uh, what what coherent sheaves on uh, on this object kind of look like. So the story is again parallel with the ordinary story. So if you have a um, if you have a module over uh, over a ring, that module gives you a coherent sheaf on the um, or a quasi-coherent sheaf on the on the scheme corresponding to that ring, and the same thing here happens if you start with a module for the monoid. Then, using standard constructions, you get a quasi-coherent sheaf on uh, on that on that monoid scheme that I described. And of course, now this, the, the, this these categories are not additive, so you can't in, in, in ordinary algebraic geometry, coherent sheaves form an abelian category. Uh, on a monoid scheme, they can't because it's not additive, but they do, um, 
they do form sort of proto-exact categories in this in this Dickerhoff Kapranov sense. So that means that we have a chance to um, to talk about Hall algebras of these coherent sheaves. Um, but so now you kind of run into a certain problem, which is um, to to uh, to get Hall algebras, we need finitary conditions. We need uh, two objects to only have finitely many uh, extensions between them. So only finitely many short exact sequences between two two objects, and that actually fails in this in this monoid context. Even when uh, the the kind of the the fan underlying the, the monoid scheme corresponds to something which is projected. Um, so that doesn't happen in the kind of ordinary setting when we when we do ordinary algebraic geometry. We have results of SER and and that tell us that uh, X in that case is finite, but but things can go wrong in this in this sort of uh, non-additive world. Um, so that's a problem. But what we can do is to pass to uh, sort of a smaller category of sheaves. Um, and so, so we define a, a class of sheaves called T sheaves. Um, um, and what are T sheaves? Well, I'll, I'll show you a bunch of pictures pretty soon, but um, these are basically, uh, these are sheaves which, which locally admit a, a grading by the, by the semi-group. Uh, so, so we've seen that uh, our 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 monoid scheme is is somehow is covered by 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 subsets corresponding to cones. Each cone corresponds to a semigroup, and and so locally we want the sheaf to sort of admit a grading by this this s sigma. Um, and there's a second condition, which actually this the second condition is something. Um, something that comes up a lot in this sort of non-additive world, which is you want, you want a type of cancellativity in, in these sheaves to, to hold. And this actually fixes the finitarity issue. So um, you, you get a, well, everything, once you impose these conditions, everything works. So how does this uh, connect to, to kind of combinatorics and, and other things? Well, the, uh, the, the basic theorem is that this, these T sheaves on affine space just correspond to skew shapes, n-dimensional skew shapes in, in the kind of ordinary combinatorial um, sense. So uh, let, me, uh, let me give an example here in two dimensions, but this works in any dimension. So, so here's, a, here's a skew young, kind of young, uh, young diagram a skew partition. And how can I think of this as a, as a module for a monoid? Well, so in two dimensions, I have the, for, for kind of the, the affine plane, I have the, the monoid on, on generators X1 and X2. So how does this monoid act on this, on this set? Well, X1 moves one box to the right until we fall off the diagram and then things go to zero. And X2 just moves up. So any, any diagram like this can be thought of as a module um, over, over, this, over this monoid, and therefore it can be thought of as a coherent sheaf, okay? Um, and so uh, I can make the remark here is that this, 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 uh, this is a picture of, a, of a, in this kind of monoid setting of a torsion sheaf supported on uh, on the sort of third formal neighborhood of the origin, because three is the smallest power of of this maximal ideal that kills all all elements here. So if you if you if you take any positive path of length, uh, you know, at least three, you're going to fall off this diagram, and that's the smallest number that works. Okay, so here's some uh, here's some other pictures of of, of sheaves. Uh, so these diagrams can be infinite. So so here. I'm thinking of a diagram that continues off to infinity in the y direction and the x direction. Um, and uh, so this, this would correspond to a coherent sheaf uh, uh, supported on the union of the x and y axes. Uh, this is a diagram which is just kind of, you know, has something missing in the lower left-hand corner, but is infinite beyond 
uh, what I've drawn. And this is a picture of a torsion-free sheaf. Here's a picture in three dimensions. Okay, so, so this would be a picture of a, of a sheaf on A3 supported on the union of the, of the three coordinate axes. Um, and, and in general, if I have a monoid scheme, I'm going to glue these skew shapes together to get something global on it. Okay, so, so these T sheaves are just uh, sort of objects that are, con that are glued together from, from skew partitions. And the, the theorem is that, um, that, this, that this category of these T sheaves is, is, is nice, it's finitary, it's proto-exact, and, uh, and so you can define a Hall algebra. And by all the kind of abstract nonsense I've said earlier, uh, that's gonna be an enveloping algebra. So, so in other words, um, for each torque variety, we get a Lie algebra and you can ask, well, uh, what, what do these Lie algebras look like? So uh, let, me, uh, let me just here give, a, give an example of kind of how you would compute a Lie bracket here between so here I've chosen sort of two torsion sheaves. These are these are finite diagrams. So they create, this is in two dimensions. So these are two torsion sheaves in, uh, in two dimensions uh, supported at the origin. And so I wanna look at all extensions between these two diagrams. And so this, this amounts to all ways of uh, the product in the Hall algebra amounts to all ways of stacking one diagram on top of another. And uh, and then anti-symmetrizing this operation. So, so S times T is, is the sum of these three terms here, always of kind of sticking T to the right and up of S, and then we anti-symmetrize. So now we're sticking the diagram corresponding to S up and to the right of T. Um, okay, so, so uh, what, you, what you get in, as a sort of a byproduct of this is that for instance, that the, uh, you know, that skew shapes and n dimensions have a Lie algebra structure and this uh, under this bracket and, and this, in fact, these, these, the structure constants for this Lie algebra are always plus or minus one and zero. Um, okay, I'm starting to basically run out of time here, but um, we, we are able in certain examples to actually compute these uh, these Lie algebras attached to toric varieties. And you see stuff that looks like, uh, you know, loop certain, certain uh, pieces of, of loop algebras, like for P1, you get uh, a certain piece of loops to GL2, which is, it can be thought of sort of a classical limit of kind of Kapranov's theorem that I mentioned earlier, where he was working over FQ. Um, and, uh, for instance, and if you take uh, sheaves supported on the second formal neighborhood of the origin in, in A2, so point sheaves, again, you can look at the kind of uh, Hall algebra of this category. And uh, in this case, you get, uh, you get a certain subalgebra of, of uh, positive loops to, to GL2. And there are other examples. So, so we're able to do, you know, P2, well, we're able to exhibit a basis for P2 and, and, and in some cases, uh, when we truncate this Lie algebra, we're able to sort of identify it with things that, that are known. But, uh, but in general, the structure of these things, which again, are believed to be classical limits of some type of quantum group are, are still pretty mysterious. All right, I'm gonna stop here. So thank you very much. All right, let's thank Matt. Are there questions? Uh, yes, I would like uh, to ask a question on these black dots on the shapes. You, you want to symmetrize these black dots to get uh, to get a Lie bracket. So um, uh, no, no, sorry. it was just uh, at the end. And um, oh. oh, okay. The... Uh, after that, here? yeah, 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 yes, yes. So uh, do you do you have some properties for this black dot? For example, is it a pre Lie structure or whatever? Um. So I uh, I don't think in general I mean it's certainly for 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 a general uh, proto exact category I don't uh, I don't expect this to be pre Lee because I mean th this is more of a kind of intuition that I have uh, more than a theorem but uh, what, what pre Lee is about insertion and sort of in a single spot mm -hmm. so if you have these skew shapes they interact when you, you you're not really inserting in a single kind of yeah okay. fine place like on a tree. And that ruins the pre-Lie property. And so, 
So, so this came up, I, I thought about trying to do sort of an insertion elimination type thing for these, for these skew shapes and then things kind of fall apart precisely because when you stick them together, they kind of, the, the interaction is non-local in some sense. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I had a quick question. You, you mentioned the, the K theory of these, uh, these uh, categories. Mm -hmm. um, and in the very specific example of fruited trees, which have been studied in, in great detail. What is the answer? What are the what is the K theory for those? Um, it's uh, it, so so I, um, I I think we're free. So I'm embarrassed to say I don't. It, it it's something that again contains the the stable homotopy groups of the of the sphere spectrum. I think you can kind of you can write it as a sort of more or less a, a, a sort of a smash product of that with something else. But I don't. I'm going to get it wrong if I. I say it now, but I can, I can look it up. I think and tell you. I mean, the, the fact that the trees are like a co-free kind of Hopf algebra. I mean, is, is that? I mean, I would have expected something trivial or, or something very generic for for these kind of K-theory well, questions. Well, one what one wouldn't expect pointed sets to give you the, the stable homotopy groups of the sphere spectrum, right? Yeah. So so, uh, so yes, I agree that it's okay. Surprising. So I will not dare to ask what happens for graphs. Thank you. Well, I don't know, but that, that's, I think that would be an interesting question, yeah. Thanks. I think I have a question, but mm -hmm. cluster algebras are very popular in physics at the moment, and there are people who say that cluster algebras are all algebras of quiver laps or something like that. Do you have a comment? Um, no, I mean, so I've, I've, I've also heard this, I've, I've heard people trying to kind of relate this I mean, I think they they arrive they, they arise in the slightly different way as if you start mm -hmm. mutating a quiver, but but I don't understand the precise relationship between okay. them and the whole algebra story. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? I always find it very amusing that this F one philosophy it's almost the opposite of the way you do Q counting, where you would often start with a binomial identity and generalize it to the Q form. And here you're doing the opposite, where you're taking something that makes sense at the Q level and going the other way. Anyway, uh, if there are no other questions, then let's thank Matt again. Excellent.